This is The Cube, live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside The Cube. We're back at The Cube, SiliconANGLE.com's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010, live. I'm here with Dave Vellante, my co-host for the week. It's the last day. I mean, things are happening. John, four days. <laughs> this is a, we're at the epicenter of a transformation of the IT industry. It's great to be here. It's a cloud revolution. We heard so many uh, good things going on here from you know infrastructure applications, software developers, uh, big money flowing in from the VCs, huge ecosystem revenue pouring in. The big guys are just totally changing their game. So it's just it's just awesome, and and the news is just continuing to pour in on three par. How many times? Oh, wow, that's unbelievable with three par. And we called it here yesterday, right? We t we, we yeah. sat here late last night, and we said the ping pong match is not over. That that the the Dell is going to match. Yeah, Dell matched, yeah. and we said HP is going to take it higher. This thing's going to go higher yeah. than the valuation that data domain got from EMC. Bang. We nailed yeah, it. We called it, I called it over two billion. My yeah. first blog post, it's and great. Uh, we called it last night that Dell would counter, HP would win it. Uh, you know, you're shout out you're, to the, you're awesome, man. Shout out to the community, <laughs> right? Because it's the feedback loop that we get from, from the people in the community that yeah. you know, help us make these calls. Thanks so to all thank those you. Yeah, sources out there. Appreciate it. Close to the companies. We, we really appreciate it. Now, seriously, though, we saw this coming because we, you know, a lot of the analysts out there, in my opinion, do not understand the new model, the new network, the cloud revolution. And they didn't, they didn't understand the value of 3PAR. I mean, 3PAR as a storage company has a very, very interesting architecture that fits the new network and HP valued it from a perspective of not as a storage play, but an overall juice to their, to their plans. And they could take this, put it instantly into their company, and it'll throw off revenues across the board. They got EDS field sales force out there. Um, what, what is your I, angle I, on that? I think that ultimately, I think you're right. HP said, we need, to, we need to own this asset because we got to replace our aging EVA base. They looked at it and said, it's going to cost us a billion dollars in two years to do this ourselves. So, so 2.4 billion is, believe it or not, a bargain in their minds. Let's talk synergies, right? Classic, you know, hey, there's synergies, but let's really talk about synergies. HP has a huge footprint in the marketplace. They're competing with Cisco um, and all these other guys, and they have huge presence, huge consulting organization. They're a monster, they're a whale. So what, what is the synergies in your mind that this brings to their other businesses? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, well, I think that HP for years has really competed in silos, whether it's servers or networking and storage, and frankly, my view, Donatelli has brought all those together, right? He's an executive with leadership. They've gone out, they've made the, the 3Com acquisition. Now they've made a huge acquisition with, with 3PAR. Um, you look at what they did with, with Equalogic, um, bringing all those together. Now, they still have to figure out how to execute and how to be more streamlined as an organization, but they've got the pieces and they've got the leadership in place. We had the HP executives on here, uh, senior vice presidents, general managers, both servers and storage. I mean, they were amped. I mean, I feel HP wants to prove something. They're upping in their game. This is a ga this is a statement. I mean, herds out of the way. Uh, I think people in the company are saying, "Hey, we let's let's put our game faces on." Do you do you see that? Yeah, and I was impressed actually you know, f with a few of the companies who supported us here at the Cube. Thank you, you know, for for helping us you know, get content and customers. And I, I thought HP put forth some great customers. Dallas Cowboys. Uh, Dallas Cowboys, Carnegie Mellon, EMC also brought a lot of good customers. We saw, we, we had some interviews with some compellent customers as well. Um, why, does, why does HP not get the credit they deserve in innovation in their overall portfolio? Is it because it's just so big? What is your view on that? Well, I think a part of it, and we've talked about this, is that HP Labs is this renowned organization, and they just haven't been able to flow enough innovation through to revenue. I mean, I my, my, well, my opinion on HP is, is the same, and I think also HP as a culture is always based on people, contribution of people, and you know, their people have been hurting, and that came out loud and clear with the Mark Hurd. You wrote about it. that, and, and your sources indicated that there was a lot of um, disgruntled people. You know, here's my philosophy is, my, Pat McGovern, my old boss, really taught me this. You need, you need, you need three things. You need to make the numbers, and Herd did a good job at yeah, that, right? You yeah. wrote about that. And you need happy customers, but you also need happy employees. And if you don't have those three legs of the stools, eventually something, something bad's going mean, to happen. According to my sources close to HP, and, and there are many, the real issue with HP was with Herd was 
Mark Hurd was an efficiency guy. He really took that thing down to the bone, got the, the ship in the right order. But there's a certain point where efficiency, you lose momentum, right? So HP, he was well beyond his months at that. I mean, HP was, you know, being more efficient. And Hurd was catering to Wall Street, not to the business. And sometimes momentum costs a little bit. If you're, but if you're positioned and you have momentum, you can capture it. So I see HP basically rejecting that notion of, you know, meet the Wall Street's expectations, we have to invest. We heard, you know, VMware saying the same message here, momentum, long haul. Companies need to take that long haul perspective and say, this new innovation's here, we're at an inflection point. This cloud revolution is totally legitimate. The three part thing is just a great proof point that storage and the cloud is all about a new generation of architecture, products, services, and users, well, user experience. We'll talk about momentum, right? We had Todd Nielsen on a couple times, actually. And um, this, this, this company, this ecosystem has momentum. It's growing at, in, in excess of 40% uh, per year. It's, you know, VMware is becoming, and maybe, maybe is now, the new IT economy. What do you think about that? I, I think VMware is in a position right now where they could be the next Microsoft in a big way. And, and they're still a small company, relatively small. You know, we, we chatted last night with Todd Nielsen and he was telling us, you know, Maritz's philosophy is very clear. Be technically strong, have a platform, not a lot of grandstanding by Maritz. He's, he's not that kind of guy. VMware is getting down to business, build the platform, get out there, and create an ecosystem. So, you know, they're making the market, and that's a long haul yeah. view. Th this is, um, I think it's real. It feels real. Uh, it's it really interesting to me, the executives that you talk to from VMware, a lot of Microsoft DNA, and they're taking the same playbook. We, we saw that with the infrastructure and the hypervisor and vSphere. We're seeing that with the, the platform with Spring and even the applications. We, we talked to the folks from Zimbra. Real interesting play there. I'm still not completely sold on the applications play, yeah. but that's okay from my standpoint. The infrastructure and the platform is really where it's all about. And I think personally, this company over the next five years has a great shot at being a hundred billion dollar player right up there from a market value standpoint, right up there with HP, IBM, Oracle, and Cisco. What do you think about that? I think that's a good assessment. I think you know it might even be worth more if you look at what Google's doing, and you know they could be as impactful as Google and or uh, what Microsoft is. If you think about Microsoft, what they would do if they had that kind of growth and momentum in a modern era. I mean, what Microsoft was in during their run, you know, VMware has the potential. So I think it actually can go over 100 million. But I think 100 billion. 100 so billion. 100 billion. Right. Sorry. And, and the amazing thing is, is, is their their majority owner. What's their market cap is, right now? They're it's about. A, it's in the mid 30s, I would say, maybe low 30s, so 33 yeah. billion. What's EMC's is, is maybe 40 billion. So, so, so my prediction would be VMware will will surpass EMC's market value, and essentially, that that will will be you know the company, right? When you look yeah. at those two companies, if, VM, if VMware, if v to hit a hundred billion dollars, which I think is totally doable, and I think your, your assessment's correct, if they start doing anything close to what Todd Nielsen said, if they can throw off $15 for every dollar of license revenue, they'll blow past that number because what they'd be doing is basically creating an industry from scratch. And if you look at Apple and Microsoft and Intel, they did that and they created an industry um, that was kind of a hacker culture that grew into a monster of, of an industry. You know, and we we have been hearing from the developer community, and you asked this question a number of times, as did I, is where's the white space? What do you tell the developers? And my sense is this is very similar to what we, we saw in the 80s and early 90s with Microsoft, where Microsoft basically owns everything, and you're seeing VMware really be aggressive about where it innovates. Even the, you know, the security, we have security folks on later, the yeah. vShield innovations. If you're a security player, you got to be looking at it going, uh-oh. Here comes well, security VMware. was the number one reason value? we heard from people why cloud adoption was not being there. So the cloud service providers are stepping up with messaging around that, and you know the IT guys who are you know IT guys will be irrelevant if they do not uh, adopt and change fast. Well, and that's what vCloud Director was all about, right? Is is the ability to spin up um, essentially a, a cloud a cloud like infrastructure to really compete with the cloud service providers. It's early though, I mean the, the, the users that I've talked to here say it's, it's not quite fully baked, there's other richer you know, uh, products and infrastructure out there. The, this is where the ecosystem has to come in and, 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 and pull together and really solve that problem. I thought Rod Johnson had a really good quote. I asked him directly, I said, hey, what do you get excited about? I mean, you know, we just sold this company for a couple hundred, hundred million bucks. Okay, he's at VMware. That's yeah, 300 and change, he, right? His response was interesting. I thought it was going to be, yeah, we're going to change the world, software, blah, blah, blah. No, he answered really interesting. He said, the current 
green environment, the data centers, the power, the cooling is not sustainable. And, and that's an interesting angle because virtualization powers a whole new generation of architecture around what the data center is. And I wrote a post about this a year ago when, after I came out of HP Labs uh, meeting all these scientists over at HP, is that there's going to be a data center operating system and that's going to be a systems approach. So it's not about physical footprint anymore, it's about efficiency around power and enabling growth. So it's, it's a balance between efficiency and growth. And I think not a lot of folks are, are seeing that. And I didn't hear from the other guests a lot of that messaging. Well, but, but we did hear that from the Dallas Cowboys, right? Who yep. are basically using virtualization as a way to drive growth outside of the TV revenues in whatever it is, concessions and other merchandising that they're doing. Using virtualization, yeah, it cuts costs, but it allows us to, we heard, change prices on the fly, yeah, yeah. right? And, and actually drive a lot of revenue. And I think that's where VMware's big challenge is, and I, you know, hopefully they can step up to it, is going beyond efficiency and cost cutting to greater business enablement. You know, I think the, the other observation I would sh share is that it's like an earthquake has hit San Francisco right here in terms of the cloud business. It's, it's a real deal, and this, I'm seeing some consolidation with the big guys buying up companies, so some consolidation in the sectors, but what's happening in this ecosystem is everyone's out there, we talk to entrepreneurs in the trenches, we see the big guys, VMware has consolidated a message and an industry is coalescing around that. And I think you know, there's some open holes, we have questions that we'll find answers to well, with another CUBE broadcast and through cloudangle.com, but there are white spaces, but that was important. Paul Moritz clearly knew that they had to put a stake in the ground and set an agenda and say, let's consolidate. Because the people that are consolidating and coalescing around this agenda, are, it's not about efficiency and getting smaller, it's about growing. So sometimes you got to come together to grow, and that is very Microsoft-like. Yeah, and the other, you mentioned questions, the other big question that I'm hearing within the Wikibon community, and I'm presuming you're seeing it in Silicon Angle as well, is you know, what about this whole notion of a virtual desktop? Where's the tipping point? You know, today, VDI is really focused on a few niche use cases, right? Be it call center or, or, or you know, very narrow sort of use cases. And, and I think, in, in some respects, my, one of my takeaways from this show is, VDI is sort of a do-over. The whole virtual desktop, the parlance is changing from one of desktop to the end user being the point of centricity. Yeah. And I think that has a lot of potential. If VMware can figure that out um, and really make the iPads and the iPhones and the end user devices, you know, in the, bring that into the mix, much frankly in the same way that Citrix yeah. has done, VMware's got way more juice in the industry. They could really disrupt Microsoft. And the other point I'll make about that is if they don't, I think Microsoft's going to maintain control of that desktop for a long time because they got the pricing power, and, you know, obviously a good competitor. So that's the real disruptor in my mind. What do you, what do you think about that, John? You know mobile really well. Well, no, I think you're, you're right on the money and I think the key thing is, is that there are people in the legacy mindset that are clutching and grabbing and do not want to give up the desktop. And, and that's sometimes IT and sometimes other vendors. I mean, you have to you know, peel their dead hands off, off that control. And that, we saw that in other movements like the mainframe to mini and, and other, other revolutions uh, that cloud's going through. So you know, it's not just uh, IT guys who don't want to change. There'll always be pockets of that, but it's other vendors. I mean, you know, Microsoft's now got this bloated PC model um, and, and that's not clearly the direction that people want to go. They Microsoft's go the legacy, aren't they? Microsoft's legacy right now. And Microsoft's legacy has to change their game and really move fast. And we talked to Mike Neal who was really straight up about that yeah. and they're working to do it, but they just don't have the messaging. It's, it's just, it's confusing. Microsoft's confused in my mind. So, um, you know, we got we to get more data on that. And that's an open question. Can they compete? Do they want to hold on and hold on to that market? Or can they cannibalize their own dollars to be positioned for growth? And I think that's a strategic issue for Microsoft. Eat your own to own the position in the future. If they hold on too long, yeah. My, my feeling on that, John, is that Microsoft unquestionably can compete. The other question I have is, can they maintain their relevance? And we've seen their relevance wane. I mean, let's face it, VMware is the relevant company in the data center today. The ecosystem is, is behind VMware. And the reason is customers are adopting VMware. Customers want more innovation out of this ecosystem. So people are supporting it. They're talking a really strong game yeah. in terms of openness. Right, they, they have a, uh, we heard this from Rod Johnson, the, the open source ethos lives, um, but 
again, they're a profit-based company. Uh, my yeah. guess is they're I shooting think, to I, I $100 think, billion. There's just, Microsoft's so huge, and you know, people have been you know, challenging Ballmer, saying he's out of touch, and, but Microsoft's got a huge business, and so the question is, are they positioned? Their messaging is clear that they don't. They have some stuff out there you know, that, that speak and, and show some proof points, but they've just been behind. Apple's been kicking their butt on the phone side. We saw that, everyone's seeing that. Google owns search. Uh, Bing is make, trying to make a comeback. You know, small market share growth, but Microsoft's just all over the place. And uh, you know, the new generation of users don't have that brand loyalty to Microsoft like some of the you know older school legacy guys. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think I think we can agree that Windows is not driving the innovation of this industry anymore, and that hasn't been the case for many many years now. And that's why I, I sort of question the the relevance. If you're not relevant in this business, then. You're out of business. You're out of business. You yeah. know, but now, is Microsoft going to be out of business? No, with that balance sheet and that monopoly, and that's going to continue for a long, long time, but the growth is just not there. They need to turn around. They need to do what Apple did when Steve Jobs came back. Put some positioning in the ground, retrench. They got a huge labs organization. They just got to get some good guys on the front lines and just kick ass. I mean, well, Microsoft, he's got to get their get their act together. They, they've they've reinvented themselves before. You know, we'll see if they can do it again. But I, I just don't see what the answer is to stop the momentum of of VMware. Now, they're giving stuff away for free in their hypervisor. I mean, that's going to make an impact. We heard Mike Neal say they're the you know the fastest growing hypervisor on the planet, you know, from a very small base, right? So. What do you think about that? What do you think about that Microsoft playbook? Um, how is that going to affect VMware? I think, uh, I think VMworld 2010 is, is the inflection point. We are here on the ground floor, and this is the inflection point. VMworld 2010 is where it all came together, and it's like an earthquake. And it's, it's really about, Dave, you, to your question, what side of the street are you on? What side of this are you on? Are you on the innovation enablement side, or are you on the, I'm going to hold on and milk my install base, side, you know, legacy I think, side. So, you know, I think people got to look in the mirror and say, okay, which side of the street do we want to be on? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, last year, uh, 2009 VMworld, you know, the, the middle of the recession, it, it was actually pretty upbeat, but this year, explosion. I mean, it's clear to me that VMware is the IT economy. So you got, you got VMware and you got all the storage activity. EMC, number one in, in, uh, in storage virtualization. That's come out by uh, ESG. Uh, ESG put some data out there. And number one in, uh, in virtualization, I think, in general, and number one in, in VMware. Ne so, so NetApp, which, you got which NetApp I have to here. Say, NetApp, EMC, EMC's number one. You well, got NetApp well, that's in what there. I, said. I, was, I was surprised at those numbers. I mean, ESG does a good job. They, uh, you know, they've got good stats guys. And, and that was astounding to me, especially given that you know, EMC is not known as the virtualized storage company, right? That's, you think compellent, you think 3PAR, you know, to a certain extent NetApp, but you, they've you, been able to maintain their share there, which is, which is pretty impressive, and I think the reason is... Are you surprised, I mean, you know EMC, well, you're out on the East well, Coast, are you surprised that they're number one in storage? I mean, that was a, a, uh, not a super surprise to me, but I didn't know they were that deep in well, virtualization. So the thing is, that what surprised me is that they've been able to keep their share that they have in the, in the core business and, and maintain that in virtualization. We heard why from some customers and, and Rich Napolitano was on, and it's really because they do a great job of demonstrating to customers that their stuff works, right? I mean, that's, that's where EMC does really well. They have these proven solutions, they put a big investment in there, like IBM Redbooks is another one, but in storage, EMC is the gold standard for those types of reference architectures. NetApp does a great job, but they just, they don't have the scale. So at EMC, least EMC got EMC. Pat Gelsinger, worked at Intel, 30 years, Paul Moritz, the uh, CEO of VMware, worked at Microsoft. Yeah, so what do you, what do you draw a, from that, John? That's Wintel <laughs> has now moved over to a new generation where VMware and EMC are the Wintel for cloud. I mean, that's to me a, a, a data point that I'm seeing emerge out of this. And I think that's interesting dynamic, and I think <laughs> VMware actually might have a higher market cap than EMC pretty quickly. I, I don't, yeah, I, you know, I, if you, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And I think, you know what's impressive to me about meeting with the VMware executives, who are, again, a lot of former Microsoft executives, is Microsoft, great competitor, but, but did it with that monopoly advantage. VMware doesn't have that monopoly I, I advantage. Don't, I don't agree. I think Microsoft's not a good competitor. I think they've really lost it since the antitrust suit. I think the government really screwed Microsoft. And they had did some things. I was That was during my years. I was working with some of those guys over there. And they were fierce competitors. They killed Netscape, That's basically. Point, so right? they killed Netscape. Exactly. And they wait, used wait, some tactics. Wait, wait. Netscape? Novell. <coughs> well, yeah, they, they were good. Perfect, I mean, right? but I mean, their ecosystem thrived. Lotus. I mean, they killed every competitor. My, Microsoft's right? mission was clear. If you were in their ecosystem, you were gold. They took care of you, they took, and, they, and everyone won. If you were not in their ecosystem and you were a competitor, they rolled you over. Yeah, but and you know, but, but you know, that's a good point. 
uh, that you're making an interesting point. I want to I explore that a little bit. If you were in that ecosystem and you got too close, a lot of times you got gobbled up, right? Yeah, they did a lot of acquisitions, but right. there was a lot of independent no, no, software I developers. No, no, I acquisitions. I mean, you crushed. Take, take Novell, for example. Novell, and you know networking, yeah. right? Novell they're had- Still around. Yeah, they're, they're doing, doing, not doing what they used to do. They had a monopoly in, in the network operating system, and Microsoft just said, we're going to take that. Yeah, right. They were right. part of the Microsoft ecosystem for a while. They, they so, were powerful. So my question is, and developers, we're hearing this a lot from the developers, is where is the white space in VMware? Right. So you have to be really fast and really good, whether it's security or systems management or network management, and and try to deliver a value proposition that either. Let's talk about let's VMware talk about VM, VM, VMware white space and opportunity. So yeah. the show is here. It's a cloud revolution, all that great stuff. But let's let's, let's get real for a minute. Just do some critical analysis around uh, VMware. In your opinion, what do you see the open questions are? And it's a VMware show, VMworld 2010 is, is the inflection point. But what are the open items that, that we need to get answers to in your mind? What did you hear from your community over the past couple of days? What I've been hearing is really, how do we go beyond the hypervisor and how do we actually get a management environment and a framework that really can be automated, right? Because we, so you talk about cloud, you think of simplicity, fast provisioning, automation, and those things you know, are coming, but they're little pieces that are coming together. I think VMware has put down the framework. My question now is, how fast can the ecosystem adopt that framework, fill the white space, and deliver value? So, continue the momentum is a key goal for them. Get the momentum going, yeah. and let the ecosystem fill in the white spaces. Right, and that's that, you, know, we, you said it. One, one, for every dollar spent on licenses, there's 15, uh, uh, and the VCs are in investing the like crazy. We had the right. VC panel on, you know, right. from Excel Partners, great uh, NEA, By the way, congratulations for putting that together. It was fantastic. Oh, appreciate you know. it. Yeah, no, it was very relevant to the show. Where do you find those guys, John? <laughs> They're all in Palo Alto, <laughs> yeah, Menlo Park. Pretty um, connected, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, hey, we're having fun. I mean, we're, you know, I think we're, there's a lot of open questions, a lot of excitement. We're going to cover all the angles on the cloud revolution at cloudangle.com, our new site. So, you know, great to work with you and collaborate on that. Can you talk a little bit about that? So, so Cloud Angle is a new publication. Yeah, so what, what, what's, what's that all about? What's the so Cloud Angle is a new publication, cloudangle.com. It's a part of siliconangle.com. And it's really going to be very focused because we've been covering mobile and cloud and the real-time web um, on SiliconANGLE. That's been our editorial where computer science meets social science. However, this huge demand for in-depth coverage, blanket coverage, wall-to-wall -wall coverage of all, all things cloud. And we're going to do that. With Cloud Angle, we're going to have all the news covered. We're going to go in-depth on labs. We're going to go in-depth on analysis. We're going to do in-depth on opinion. And we're going to cover it all. I mean, we're going to cover this phenomenon of cloud. And VMware is the center of that, of that action. Uh, as is other vendors and all the ecosystems. So, you know, we want to cover, and I'm going to watch. I want to watch VMware. I'm going to cover them like a blanket. Okay, Todd, great guy. One dollar of license is $15 of ecosystem revenue. I want to see that. I mean, yeah. I want to see that unplay out because there's an old saying in business, follow the money. And you follow the money, that's cash. So $15 for every dollar of license revenue, that's just an ecosystem flush with cash. When you have cash, there's funding, there's innovation. So that is why if they even come close to even on a trajectory of fulfilling that objective, they'll be over a $100 billion company. Yeah, so and they're I, worth watching, <clears throat> the message is tight. I'm really pro VMware at this point. And I think the keys to that are vision, and they clearly have that, right? I mean, Maritz really is a visionary, brings that in. Execution, it looks like they've got a great execution ethos. Um, Certainly, you know, sharing some of EMCs, but even more so, bringing in the, 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 the executives that they've brought in, the team they have together, and openness. I mean, I think they got to keep well, that openness. Let's talk about, I mean, alive. there's some things that they could screw up on. Let's talk about what, what, they, what, what they'll screw up on and what will make them fail. VMware will fail if they don't hire the right people, if they turn on their ecosystem, they got to deliver. I mean, this is a major stake in the ground. VMware has changed as a company. Yeah, they're very technical. Maritz is in charge, but if they, screw over their developers, if they don't deliver on the ecosystem partnership, and if they don't hire the right people. We heard the hiring is ramping like crazy. So, you know, when you hire fast, you know, that's a risk. Yeah, so and I think another way that they could screw it up would be if EMC, you know, uh, wags the dog, if you will. Not that EMC's the tail, but if EMC starts to inject. They're the head. Uh, in, in, I mean, in, they own. The head, right, and they say, hey, we want an advantage. We want to stack the deck for us. That would kill the VMware momentum, yeah. certainly in the storage industry, and I, here's why I don't think it will happen, because I think 
the executives, the board of VMware understands that the path to 100 billion is it requires that they stay open. I think there's a relationship there, obviously, with the ownership structure between EMC and VMware, and, I, and not a lot of people are talking about this, but in my opinion, VMware is too independent, too important, and the people at VMware recognize that you know, their stuff really needs to be uh, enabling an ecosystem, so you cannot play favorites. And EMC knows, as I was told by some EMC folks, that, that you know, hey, we don't want favorites, we want to be, we just want access like everybody else, and EMC will, game will speak for itself. Well, NetApp is going to be in there, so VMware has those partnerships. So, if EMC starts to meddle, yeah, you know, it's gonna the, the boat will take on water. Yeah, I think I, I think what EMC has to do is compete on the merits of its own um, vision and its own engineering resources and the value that it can add to VMware and the ecosystem. And let's face it, EMC does a pretty good job of, of doing that. And VMware is going to play at a different part of the stack. So there's there's areas that VMware is moving into that, quite frankly, you know, EMC may or may not be have touch points. So you know, as you move up the stack to end user experience where you got things like unified environments, business policy tied into network policy and storage policy, you're going to have a dynamic real-time environment. EMC will be involved from a storage standpoint, but it won't be one vendor. Right. Okay. And, and whether that's EMC or cloud service providers or whatever other sector around VMware, VMware has to be that kernel. And, and I think, it, just staying on storage for a moment, we had Tom Georgians on here, it's very clear that, that Georgians is betting the company on virtualization, and their success rate shows that, they're growing at more than 30% a year, so there's obviously room for more than one player there. So let's wrap this up. Uh, I want to thank everyone out there who watched. We had huge numbers. I mean, I think, guys, what was the numbers? Over 200,000 viewers um, this week. We're up to uh, 200,000? That's fantastic. We're just All under right, 200,000 awesome. viewers. Congratulations. I uh, want to thank Justin well TV for not going down. We had HD content pumping out over Justin TV. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michael Sean Wright, the director of The Cube. Nice job, um, guys. Mark Risen Hopkins, editor in chief of Silicon Angle, but also producer behind the, uh, we got <laughs> behind the screens. Uh, Kristen Nicole, who's been uh, on the scene doing the reporters, and Dave, I want to thank you for being a co-host in Wikibon. And your research is cutting edge. You're a new kind of firm, and uh, we appreciate the collaboration. Uh, yeah, thank you, Josh. Thanks for you know giving us the opportunity to participate. And and if I may, uh, you know David Floyer, Stu Miniman, Bert Lattimore, you know really helping uh, pull this together. I want to say hi to my kids, Alicia, Roman, Pilar, Garrity. I miss you, be home so, soon. So special thanks goes out to John Troyer, the executive producer from VMware, who put the Blogger Lounge together and the whole social media program here. Great job. Uh, Eric great Nielsen job. and the whole crew at VMware. So we really had a great time. Um, final thoughts, I would say uh, from my standpoint, the cloud revolution is here. VMworld 2010 is the inflection point. The company pulled the story together, people are coalescing around it, huge ecosystem developing with numbers and, and dollars flowing in, and uh, a new network architecture, new storage architecture, new application architecture, and uh, it's a new path. So it's a great show. Yep, it's a place to be. We are at the epicenter here, live, day four, VMworld, SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage. We'll be back soon. <laughs>